Hey now, welcome to the City Off Campus podcast with your two favorite hosts, Sammy Sommerfeld and Jack McFarland. Before we introduce our guests, I just want to quickly remind you guys, go download and listen to us on Good Pods. Got to check it out. We're on there at Sammy Sommerfeld and Jack at Jack McFarland. Go listen to us now and find all your favorite podcasts on there. So now with our guests, we've got Kern Hawkeye. He's a member of the currently eighth ranked Iowa basketball team, Patrick McCaffrey. How's everything going with you? Pretty good. How about you guys? Good. So my first question for you is going into tomorrow's game against Michigan State. How is this week's preparation after like two back to back losses different than like weeks prior when, you know, you're coming off a few wins and stuff like that? Um, I would say th- like in terms of like what we do, like with the coaches and like our whole practice and our just kind of daily setup, like preparation, it's always it's all the same. Like it's always going to be the same no matter if we lose or win 10 games in a row or lose 10 games in a row, it's always going to be, like, the same kind of thing. Because, But, like, in terms of players, I would say we're definitely probably more, like, locked in, I guess, because we know that we, we we have big game Tuesday and that we got to got to get a win, kind of get back on track. But just in terms of what we do with the coaches and everything, it's it's very similar to any normal practice day. And so now that you guys are kind of going into the last month of regular season Big Ten play, what are your expectations for yourselves going into that as a team personally? What are some of the goals there? We've had the, the same goal since, since about, well, I would say since about April. And then it kind of reiterated when Luca came back, we want to win a big 10 championship that that's been our goal since day one. We want to, we want to make a run in the tournament. We want to make, make a final four win a national championship. We got to, got to do the big 10 first, make a run in the Big Ten tournament and just kind of take it all one by one. But our goal has been the same ever since we knew our roster and everything is to win a Big Ten championship. So with COVID and an empty Carver, and how, how has the team and yourself personally been able to really appreciate this season? And for you, you haven't really been able to play. You played two games last year. But like, mm-hmm. how has this been different for you guys to not have a packed Carver but still enjoy each moment? Yeah, I mean, I guess I think something – I, I can't speak for everybody, but for me personally, like when the NCAA tournament got taken away last year, like that was kind of something that I always saw like growing up, like it's like, like nothing, like the NCAA tournament's going to happen in March, like every single year. And that's that. So like kind of seeing that might not like, well, that, that didn't happen and that it can be taken away. It really kind of set us like set us more solid. I'm trying to think of a way to say this, but like just kind of like made it like made us easier to realize for us kind of what we're able to lose. So just kind of looking forward, like take every moment, like don't make sure not to take any moment for granted and just kind of move forward. And like, cause at the end of the day, we all love playing basketball. So like, we want to make sure we can take full advantage of every opportunity that we get to kind of, and we know we have a special team. We have a chance to finish out our special season. So we want to make sure that we do that the right way and that we're able to be safe, but also have the opportunity to play. One thing I want to touch on with the special team is your dad has special shoes every game and game against Illinois, his shoes were dapper. Like mm-hmm. where, where, where does he get them? Like what's the, what's the story on those? Cause he's, he's, he's got shoe game. Yeah, no, he does. Well, the thing is like, it's not like him, like, like it's my mom probably more so than it is okay. him. I don't really know. I don't know where he got those. Like somebody made them for him, but like, I remember I was sitting kind of on the side before we started, like, really, like, I finished my little warm-up thing before we start, like, really warming up, and I was sitting on the side with him, and the Illinois coaches were, like, walking by looking at his shoes, like, saying stuff to him about him, like, how they were cool and stuff like that, so that was pretty neat to see, but, um, yeah, somebody made those for him, I think, it was, like, my mom is friends with an artist or something who was able to put those together. So I think, like, he was able to get the shoes from Nike, and then they were kind of able to just kind of color them and build off them in that way. So I want to ask you then, um, as a basketball player playing at a Nike school, what are some of your favorite shoes to wear on the court? And what are some of your favorite shoes to wear off the court? So me, like, I wear my Giannis's, the Giannis ones every game. They're, like, I, they're ripped to shreds because I wear – because, like, I don't want to break in another pair of shoes right now. So, like, they're, they're, they're bogus right now because just – because I've been wearing them so much. But, like, they're really comfortable – and they're, they're my favorite shoe to probably wear when I play. Growing up, I was so, like, when I was in high school, I played on an Adidas AU team. And, like, I, I was in touch with a lot of the Adidas stuff. So I got a lot of Adidas gear. So for the most part in high school, I wore Adidas shoes, like Adidas socks, Adidas, like, all that, because I had a lot of stuff. 
So I was a pretty big Adidas guy. So it was a switch when I got to college and it wasn't as, I wasn't as big on Nike as I was the Adidas. So I kind that was kind of a change for me, but off the court, I would say that I used to be like more so of a sneaker head. Like when I was younger, like probably freshman or sophomore year of high school. And then like, I kind of got out of it. Like I, I still wear cool shoes. Like when I play and like, if we like, if I like dress up or something, then I'll wear like, I have, a, I have a decent amount of Jordans still because I was a sneakerhead at one point in time. And I've had the same shoe, shoe size since I was like 14. So I've able to kind of, I've been able to keep all those, but I would say, um, yeah, I love, like, I love Jordans off the court, like 11s. Like I love 11s. I played in 13s in high okay. school when I wasn't wearing Adidas. I played in the, he got game 13s. Uh, I like the fours. Like I like all sorts of Jordans. So off the court, those are probably my favorite, but on the court, I definitely like my Giannis's. And yeah, I would say those are probably my favorite. Nice. So what is your pregame and postgame routine look like? So pregame, um, I come on the court. I try to get out there pretty early. Uh, home games, it's easier, but road games, it just kind of depends, uh, like on like just kind of how far we are from the gym and that sort of situation. So road games, I still get out there pretty early. So we we start like our team warm up at like 60 minutes. So before that, I'll usually try to get um, I try to probably make like upwards of a hundred shots before that, like a combination of things like mid range jump shots, threes, kind of little floaters in the lane, layup, stuff like that. I'll try to make like around a hundred shots before we start like our other warm up, And then, then I go forward with that. Um, we shoot at shoot around earlier that day. Like we'll have shoot around depending on what time the game is, but usually shoot around will be sometime in the morning around 11 or so. So I'll shoot a shoot around too. And then um, after the game, uh, it depend. A lot of it depends on how my body feels, so that sort of depends on how much I played. Really, is how much is how my body feels. So I would say, after the game, like if I feel if I still feel pretty good, then I'll go up and I'll just kind of I'll, I'll go up with one of our managers and I'll just shoot, like kind of work on. I won't really have a specific plan in mind. I'll just kind of work on whatever shots like that I didn't feel as comfortable with in the game and kind of do stuff like that and just kind of work forward like. If I miss some free throws, then I'll go shoot a bunch of free throws. If I miss a couple floaters, layups, stuff like that, then I'll work on floaters, layups. If I don't feel comfortable with my three ball, then I'll go shoot threes, so so on and so forth, that sort of stuff. So it just kind of depends on how the game goes based on what I do post game. So after growing 10 to 15 pounds from last year to this year, how do you see that added mass helping your game and yourself this year? Um, I, w- it's, I don't get knocked off my spots as easy because I'm somebody that likes to go to the rim. I like to go to the basket. So like, but like last year, like if I were to go to the basket, I would need a pretty clear path because if somebody like hit me, it would just knock me off my spot and I would just pull it back out and pass it, move it on or and stuff like that. But so it's easier for me to kind of go through, like kind of just explode through that, uh, th- that contact and kind of get, get to the rim easier and get to my spots easier. Um, yeah, I would say that's probably it just, it makes it easier for me to not get knocked off my spots. And I would say defensively, I have more mass to where I can use that to maybe potentially knock people off their spots and kind of not get like, uh, not get hit as hard or like where it would affect me that much. That sort of, stuff. that sort of stuff. Has there been a moment this year in any of the games that you've played in that you think, um, well, obviously it's, it's not like early in the year, but it's, you're kind of mid season at this point, maybe tail end, but has there been a moment or any time where you've, you've thought this has been a defining moment in my growth as a player, or are you still, you still waiting for that time? Um, I would say, I would say just kind of every second I'm out there is like, like the more, like, I, I feel like I would get exponentially more comfortable. Like the more that I'm out there, like every possession that I'm out there, I feel more and more comfortable with like what I'm doing. Like, especially like when, since we started playing, like, like I remember our first like game against like a, t- like a high major team was North Carolina. So like out there, like I was kind of like, whoa, like it's really fast. Like these guys are really big. <laughs> like it's just a lot of stuff going on. And I, I don't want to say I wasn't ready, but like it, it just kind of took me back a little bit, just kind of caught me by surprise. But then like the more of those games that we played, just kind of the more comfortable I got and kind of every possession I've been out there, the more and more comfortable I feel every basket I score, the more and more confident I feel like every, every time I do something like, cause really like last year I played, like you said, I played two games. Like I played probably 26 minutes in those two games. So I didn't really know what I could do. Like sometimes you even doubt, like if you even have what it takes to play at that level, like that sort of thing. 
but like this year, like I'm not saying I've had a great year by any means, but like I've, I've, I feel like I've shown that I'm capable of potentially like making noise in that regard to where like I can get to the spots I want to get to. I can do some of the stuff that I want to get to. And so that is going to be able to help me and give me the confidence knowing that I am actually capable of doing it moving forward in years where I would play more and that sort of stuff. So I want to ask you about your recruitment journey. We ask a lot of Iowa athletes and college athletes that we have on the podcast about their different paths. So you have a very different situation because you lived in the house with your head yeah. coach. So can you share about like why you wanted to play for your dad over like, you know, you were a you know pretty high ranked recruit yourself. Like I'm sure you could have gone to other places. So like, mm -hmm. what was that whole process like for you? And if other coaches approached you, like what were those interactions like? I didn't want to waste anybody's time like with recruiting because I knew that I was going to go. I, I knew there was a pretty good chance I wanted to go here. Growing up, I always wanted to play like for my dad. Like everybody has like your basketball heroes, your sports heroes, like outside, like LeBron James is my basketball hero, but outside of LeBron James, like my heroes are like Aaron White, Devin Marble, like, and then even his players at Siena, like Kenny Hasbrook, Ronald Moore, Ryan Rossiter, like all those guys, like those were my basketball heroes. So I kind of wanted to follow like in their footsteps rather than go somewhere else and do that like elsewhere. Cause I just wanted to play it from, like, I always thought my dad's players growing up were like the coolest people ever. So I always wanted to put myself in that position. Yeah. Um, recruiting wise, I got like, like uh, the day they could text all of us. Like I got, I got some texts, I got some calls, but I just didn't really want to waste anybody's time because I knew that I was going to go here, especially cause I went to like a bunch of those camps, like in high school where I was away from home a lot. And like the more I was away from home, I was like, I actually kind of miss like Iowa City. Like I want to, I want to go home. Like I miss my family. So now it's like when I have the opportunity to go see my parents and like be around like my brother and my dad every day. Like that's something that's really important to me and something that I take a lot of pride in. So you know, you kind of were coming in like at a really important point of the program where they just came off of losing. You know, barely not making it to the Sweet Sixteen. And so what did your, what was your team or your dad's vision for the team either coming off of that or, you know, around the time you and Joe and a few other guys were coming into that recruitment class? Um, he just knew that we had a lot of special, like we had special talent going forward. And so like going into that year, so my freshman year where I ended up sitting out, he knew that we had a lot of talent. You look at it and you see, well, we lost Tyler, we lost Isaiah. And like we, you, we, so that's how some of that roster turnover and people were kind of, they didn't really know what to expect, but everybody in the locker room and all the coaches and everybody knew like what we had, like we knew how good CJ was. Nobody really knew how good CJ was before that, but like we all did. And then like, I had seen what Luca had done that summer. So people ask me all the time, like, were you surprised at what Luca was able to do that year? And I'm just absolutely not. Cause if you saw what he was able to do, like, in that summer and how hard he was working and like what he was able to accomplish, like just in like pickup games, practice, stuff like that. You knew that he was geared up for that year. And we knew that we had Jack Nunji coming back. Unfortunately, his season obviously got cut short, so he wasn't able to play. But he he put himself in position to have a really successful season that year. And we knew like like BK came in and we knew how good BK was. And we knew we had a lot. Weezy was able to step up into a bigger role and we knew what we had in that locker room. So I feel like that was able to make that that made it easier for us to kind of transition into that period. So when was the moment last season where the team was kind of like we could make a run? I would say probably after the Texas Tech win. I would say that was when because like we didn't really know we got smacked by DePaul early, but like that was early. Nobody really knew like we were still kind of figuring each other out like it was a whole new situation. But then we beat Texas Tech, who was ranked, I think, like 13th in the country at that time. Yeah. And we were like, OK, like we're like we're, we're just as good. Like, like I remember watching the film. I wasn't playing at this point, but I remember watching the film like of the of Texas Tech, like before we played them, like when we had like film sessions and meetings and stuff like that. And I was just thinking to myself, like, like we're better than them. <laughs> like we, we can very easily beat them. Like they're ranked 13th, whatever they were ranked and they're undefeated. But I was like, we could very easily beat them. And we ended up beating them. So that was obviously something that was cool. And then just kind of moving forward, like. Once we got that one, I felt like it kind of was able to set us apart, like confidence wise. And we knew what we had with uh, Luca and everybody else was kind of just kind of following that. And we were able to make a pretty, pretty successful season out of it. 
Yeah, definitely. You coming out of Iowa and being around the program. So like you and Connor have had this, I don't want to say advantage, but you have been around the program since your dad took over. Like you've seen Mm -hmm. the culture change. How have you seen it change over time? Like from when you first got there to now? Um, that's a good question. Um, I would say like, I would say like something that my dad really prides himself on, like in terms of like recruiting is just like, like not only talented players, cause that's kind of a given, but like high character individuals. And he had high character individuals coming in. Like when he first got here, like guys like Matt Hayton's Jared Cole, or like some really good guys. Like a lot of those guys were, and so I feel like that's something that he was really able to kind of like, that's something he's always been really big on is just like kind of high character. Like not really, we don't really want any egos like involved, like people mad about minutes, shots, whatever. Like we always want to make sure everybody like taking care of what they need to take care of in the classroom, off the court, that sort of stuff. Cause we don't really want any distractions when we go on the court. So I would say that's probably a big part of it was just like every, like a lot of the players that my dad's had since he's been here have been really like high character guys, like good people to have in your locker room. But in terms of just like kind of the culture, like obviously we run a really fast paced offense. Like we, we get the ball out of the net and go, like we go really fast. Like we run on makes and misses. So I would say that's probably different than the previous coaching staff. Cause I feel like they were probably more so slow down. That sort of stuff like low, we're, we're high paced, high possession game. Like we want to get the ball out of the net and go get easy baskets and transition, that sort of thing. So I would say with the high character guys, and then also the, just kind of the pace of how we play, we're probably the two biggest things that I've noticed in terms of what's changed. What are some of your favorite Iowa basketball moments from, you know, the time you were a kid coming to the games and hanging around the facility and hanging out with, Mm -hmm. you know, different guys. And from those experiences, you know, you've seen, you know, some great wins and some great losses. So Mm -hmm. how have you been able to bring that into your experience as a player to try to make it what you want it to be? Well, like for my favorite moments, I would say probably my favorite moment was the the Davidson game on my birthday for the tournament when we beat them by like a thousand. That game was that game was fun. I remember that. I had a really good time at that game. And then like another game that was like that was made me really proud to be like an Iowa fan was the the Tennessee game. Although that we lost, but it was like it was a really inspiring game and it was like a great like it was really fun to watch. We came back from that far to force overtime. Like we had, we had a couple chances to win the game. Like, so that game obviously made me really proud to be an Iowa fan and like Woodbury's tip in against Temple in the tournament. That was obviously really cool. So like a lot of those guys and like, just kind of like, like I was talking about earlier with like my basketball role models with like Mike Cassell, Jared Utah, Adam Woodbury, Aaron White, like all those guys, it was just really cool kind of to see how far the program has come since we've been here. What's it like to be a part of a team, you and Connor both being coaches' sons, and a lot of other programs don't have two coaches' sons playing at the same time, but I feel like a lot of fans and even opposing fans like to make it a point or um, sometimes even a jab that you guys are coaches' sons, and they always like to make like jokes or whatever, snide comments about the name on the back of your jersey when in reality all you guys care about is the name on the front. Like, What challenges have there been for you or both of you being Iowa basketball players, but also playing for your dad? I feel like in terms of, like, what we have in the locker room, there haven't been very many challenges at all. Because, like, I grew up playing with Joe Weiss camp. Like, I grew up – kind of grew up playing with Austin Ash. Kind of knew Lucas since they were sophomores in high school. Like, I grew up playing against j So did Connor. Like, so we all knew each other. And, like, we all knew, like, what we have in the locker room and, like, Whereas, like, we don't really get too locked into what the fans say because, like, at the end of the day, we don't really care because the only opinions that matter are the ones of our players, like the, my teammates and then the coaches. Those are the only opinions I would ever really listen to besides, my like, my mother and, like, stuff like that. But just kind of, like, the players and the coaches. So we know Connor and I have the respect of the players and coaches in the locker room. So, like, that's kind of all that really matters. Like, nobody else really reads too deep into anything because it's just, like, like, we know what we have and, like, the guys in our team know what we're capable of and they know that we're more than worthy of being on the team. So that's all that really matters. So they're able to kind of like, there's no really coaches, whatever bias involved or anything like that. And to throw back to high school, obviously playing on the same high school team as Connor, like what was the best and worst thing about being on the same team? 
Um, I would say the best thing is probably, was probably just the talent that we both had and were able to kind of bring to the table every game. Like we were both like obviously pretty good high school players. So um, it was like just kind of an advantage that I had both that we had both of like we had each other to play with that every game. I would say probably the worst part is that like like I don't know, like you guys have brothers. Yeah, <laughs> like, I, I don't have a brother. Same. I do. Like like brothers fight like so like it's just like kind of it's just a given like that brothers are gonna fight and we're both like ultra competitive. He's like like I'm competitive, but like he's competitive to kind of like another level. Like he like he's he's super duper competitive. So like we're both we're both competitive. So we kind of would just kind of go at each other like a decent amount because we both would expect so much out of the other. Mm-hmm. So like that was kind of probably one of the negative sides. Was just so like the both drives were- drives home weren't quiet from the game. Sometimes, sometimes you would say like, "Oh, this sequence, you should have given me the goddamn ball instead <laughs> of going here." You guys are just saying what could have gone right or wrong. No, I would say more so the fights were like in practice or open gym where we were playing okay. against each other, like rather than like with each other. Like I would say, like when we we're playing against each other, like we would always end up like getting mad at each other, or like. Like me, like in high school, like I was like, I'm like, well, sh- even now, like I'm, I'm wired to score. Like that's kind of how I play. Like I, I try to score the ball. So like he, I would take a shot he didn't like or something like that. And he, he would bitch at me, like he'd get mad at me. And I'll just, and I would just tell him like, like, shut up, like who cares? Like whatever, stuff like that. And he, so like, it was more so about like when we were on the same team, it was more so he would get on me for taking a bad shot or something like that. And that's kind of, that's and then a fight would stir up from there. Talk about um, your experiences and even just the entire entirety of it, just the, the underrated AAU basketball scene within the state of Iowa and just high school basketball in Iowa. Because I think mm-hmm. a lot of people nationally do not give Iowa the respect it deserves when it comes to basketball and the talent that is produced here. So, mm-hmm. like, what was that like for you playing? And was there ever a moment where people from another state kind of, like, saw you at the beginning of the game, like a tip, and you're like, oh, my God, we're playing, like, a team from Iowa? Like, every game. Every yeah. game. I shit you not. Every game. <laughs> makes like, sense. Especially when I was on the Barnstormers. Because my my last year of AU, I switched to play for D1 Minnesota because some stuff happened with the Barnstormers. That I didn't want to play. But I switched to play for D1 Minnesota, so it was obviously very different because we had – well, we had two guys that are now in the NBA – Another our third starter started at starts at Wisconsin, and then our fourth starter is the leading scorer in the ACC, and then I was the fifth starter. So we had a pretty good team. So nobody really looked at us any way like that. But like for the I when I was on the Barnstormers, it was every game. Like they'd look at us and they were like, what the fuck? Like, oh, like like stuff like that. They so every team thought they were just gonna rail us, and then all of a sudden like we're up like twenty to ten, like and we're like like we make like six threes right at the beginning of the game, like to start it off, and we just like we kept winning. Like we had a really successful Iowa Barnstormers team, especially my 16 year year. We beat a lot of teams that quite frankly, we had no business beating. Like, and it was just teams that just kind of like just looked at us and looked the other way. Like they just didn't really believe that we had the talent to really accomplish anything. But then like me and then my other teammates were kind of able to set the record straight and beat a lot of those teams that probably were more talented than us, but we played, smarter harder and we had we had some pretty freaking talented guys too so i would say that the au scene i was incredibly overlooked it's probably not as deep as the other states just because we don't have as many people as a, like chicago wisconsin new york like so we don't have as many people but like i would say like from guys like one to ten like i would say pretty close to even but like it's probably not as deep so we can't have as many successful teams but we had like i mean we we beat the best of the best those years. So I would say like we had a pretty good run at everything. I think just to like add on top of that, I looked at your 24 seven profile, not like you ever have or anything, but one of the guys on there gave a player comparison when you were a senior in high school. And just to go along the lines of underrating Iowa, they called you Chandler Parsons. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what the hell that even means. I don't know <laughs> if you know what that means, but <laughs> I mean, like, probably just because I'm a tall, skinny, white guy. <laughs> yeah. the ball. I would say that's probably what it was. <laughs> like, hopefully it was the Chandler Parsons when he signed for four years, $80 million or whatever it was. <laughs> hopefully that's when I got that comparison rather than the Chandler Parsons now who's been kind of riddled by injuries and had an unfortunate end of his career. But hopefully it was the, the max contract Chandler Parsons that they were talking about with me. <laughs> what are your some of uh, your favorite Iowa traditions that – 
you've been a part of now being a student, but even ones that you experienced growing up? Well, the football games, I think, are really cool. Like, like that's a special environment, especially with the way. But even before that, like, I, I, I love going to football games because, like, there's just so many people. Like, the, the atmosphere is electric. Like, I, I just I miss having fans at football games this year. That was something that I really missed about the fall was I really miss going to football games. And, like, I also really liked when I was in high school, I loved high school football. Like, I loved, like, going, sitting in the student section, screaming for two hours, three hours, however long I was going to be there. Like, I, I definitely missed a lot of that sort of stuff. So I would say, like, fall football in Iowa is something that I think is really cool. Like, because you go to the high school games on Friday, and then I would go to the Iowa game on Saturday. And, like, when I was in high school, it would be, like, with the recruits and everything like that. So it was a pretty unique experience. And also, like I like I like our basketball games in the Big Ten, the Big Ten ACC Challenge that sell out. Like I think those are really cool. We obviously don't have those this year, but I think those are really cool and really fun to be a part of too. Like just the atmosphere and everything is crazy. Every time you make a shot, I feel like the roof's gonna explode. Like I miss that stuff, so I can't wait to have it back. Hopefully next year. If you had to choose between making a dagger three pointer at the end of a game or like you just said, letting the crowd blow the roof the fuck off and yamming it on someone, which one would you choose? I, I love dunking on people, but I would have to say probably a dagger three-pointer because, like, especially on the road, like, I feel like that would be really cool. Like, like when their atmosphere is crazy and you make a dagger three-pointer on the road just because it kind of seals the win. But I, 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 I love dunking on people, too, so I would say that's a tough one, but I think I would have to say the dagger three-pointer just because it seals the win, but that was not an easy decision for me at all. <laughs> so going off that, then, I have to ask you, what are some of your favorite Big Ten arenas to play in, outside of Carver, of course, and what's been one of your favorite moments where, you know, you guys have a comeback win or you win at the end of the game and you just silence the crowd? What's been like, you know, there's been a few, but what's been your favorite mm -hmm. one you've been a part of? Um, I would say I really like Maryland's arena. I think their arena is really cool. I like Indiana's arena just because like it just has so much history, that sort of thing. Um, I, you know what arena I really liked this year was the rack Rutgers. I thought that place was sweet. Really? Yeah. A lot of people talk a lot of shit about it and say that it's kind of like a dump, but I, I thought that place was so cool, dude. I walked in there. I was like, this place is sweet. <laughs> I think it's because, like, I really like college basketball. Like, I'm a college basketball junkie. So, like, like the rack has, like, a pretty cool reputation. So, I would say that's probably why I was more so, like, like bought into the rack. But I like I like that place. I'm trying now to answer the second part of your question about, like, a win. Let me think. Um, oh, well, we played in the Carrier Dome last year, and that was cool. That place wasn't as loud though for how many people are there just because it's so big. Like, so the, it's harder to make a lot of noise. Um, this year, like winning at Rutgers was really cool. Winning at Maryland was really cool, especially in the fashion of how we did it. Last year, winning at Minnesota was cool. Like, um, I'm trying to think of what other games were. Michigan State's arena was kind of, was, was really cool, especially last year with everything packed because it was a really big game in terms of like the big 10 standings at Michigan state. So that place, we didn't end up pulling that one out, but we were right there. So that was a really cool game. But yeah, I would say I don't like, I like all the big 10 arenas to be honest. Like I, I think we have the best arenas. We lead the nation in attendance. So I would say that like, I would say I like all the big 10 arenas, like even Northwestern's like, cause they just did it up and made it really nice. I think that place is really nice, but I, I, I like all of them. What about Hilton Coliseum? <laughs> Yeah, uh, that place was right, nice, you know, but we, we didn't really give it. We didn't really give them much to cheer about, so that was good. I guess. <laughs> but that place was so loud, though it was crazy loud, crazy yeah, loud. Yeah, but we didn't really give them much to cheer about, so we 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 controlled our own destiny there. I'm a broken record when I say it. I mean, I grew up in Ames, and obviously, growing up in Ames. Oh, it's I'm sorry. That you no, that. look, it's fine. Like I, that's moved what I there. say to him too. Listen, no, it's not <laughs> like I was born in Iowa. I moved there, so I was just a, a fan by happenstance. And I, look, it happens. But when you grow up with Hilton Magic, because Iowa State's not very good, and when they beat people at home that are good, it's like, holy shit, this is exciting. Yeah, and it's kind of a cool arena, you know. And I saw Hilton Magic's a lot easier though when you have Monte Morris and George Niang <laughs> and, 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 and like. <laughs> 
and that's something a lot of people I forget. Don't really is, know how much I believe in the other magic, but I believe in those guys. <laughs> like, they got, yeah. I believe in Monte when, Morris, George Niang, all those guys. It's a lot easier to win when you have them. I don't know. No, I don't people do people don't play. realize, like, Fred Hoiberg put four NBA guys on Iowa State, and they're like, hey, Iowa State's got yeah, a basketball team now. Yeah, no, exactly. It's, it's a lot easier. Oh, it's, <laughs> the atmosphere was crazy, though, last year. It was crazy. I'll give them that. That place was really it was loud. It was really loud. It is very loud. Talking about, like, you being a college basketball junkie, What's one of your favorite moments that's a non-Iowa moment? Like, just from watching games, consuming a lot of college basketball games, is there a tournament moment? Is there, you know, ACC, whatever. Like, what's a moment that you love? I would say probably the first one that came to mind was Gordon Hayward's half quarter that almost went in. Yeah. That's probably the first one that comes to mind. Um, Let me think. Oh, I was at the Final Four where – um. Uh, UConn made the big run with uh, Shabazz Napier and Ryan Boltwright, and they played Kentucky with Julius Randle and James Young and those guys. Do you guys remember that game where James Young drove down the middle lane, dunked on like three people? I was sitting, I was sitting like not courtside, but I, I had pretty good seats for that game, so I got a good look at that. So that was obviously really cool. Um, I would say another NCAA moment that I thought was really cool was. Uh, like UMBC beating Virginia and then Virginia coming back and winning to all the next year. Like that was obviously yeah. really cool. Um, and then uh, let me think there's there, like, I mean, there's too many NCAA moments that are incredible to really count. Like, but yeah, I mean, like I would say those are probably the first few that come to mind. Awesome. Well, let me ask you. So with your team right now, like, I, so I've been going to games for the last few years, not this year, of course, but um, it just always looks like you guys have such a tight bond and like such good team chemistry. And like, you know, the bench goes crazy for you guys. You guys go crazy for the bench guys when they come in. Where does that come from? How do you guys build it? What do you guys do to build that camaraderie? I would say a lot of it comes back to what I was saying earlier, just about having high character guys. Like just have like like just we all like they're like everybody on our team is a good dude, like a good solid dude. And like a lot of it comes from the fact that like we've been playing together for a while now. Like especially like guys like J Bo, Luca, like Connor. This is their like fourth year playing together. Weezy, CJ, lumped in with those guys. It's their third year playing together. So it's like they know each other really well, and like we've been around each other a lot. And, like, we all live with each other, so it's just kind of, like, our bond is really deep. We do a lot of stuff together. Like, we hang out a lot. We do a lot of all sorts of stuff. So I would say just, like, we all really like each other, and we all want to see everybody succeed. So I would say that's probably what is the, the coolest part, and that's probably what leads everybody to kind of going crazy and all that sort of stuff, especially now this year because we have to kind of create our own energy just in, like, just in terms of the bench because, like, we're not getting as much from the fans, obviously, because there's no none there, but – um, yeah, so I would say that that stuff's really important. So with COVID and stuff and not being able to do much else other than play basketball right now, are you guys like, what are you guys doing when you guys are hanging out? Are you guys like playing video games, like watching movies? Like what are you guys yeah. doing to build that, you know, bond and just having fun off the court? A lot of Fortnite. We play Fortnite together a lot. Um, sometimes we'll play Mario Kart. Austin Ash has a Wii, so sometimes we play Mario Kart. But so – like Connor, Luca, Michael, Nico, and Austin all live in a house together. So sometimes we'll go, we'll all go hang out there. Like we did that a lot during football season, like watch the Iowa games. Like we'd have like eight or nine guys posted up at the house, stuff like that. But then, yeah. So I would say like a lot of Fortnite video games, like, and then just kind of just hanging out together, like whether that's at the house or whether like somebody else's apartment where we all just spend time together, or do certain things, you know, like stuff like that. Being from Iowa City, what's like one of your favorite underrated places to eat? Well, I don't know if it's really underrated, but Ponchero's, right. I eat there all the time. I love Ponchero's. Like, I, I, that's been my favorite food spot for a while. I really like uh, Charlie's in the mall, the, the Coral Ridge Mall, Charlie's. I'm kind of going through like a Philly cheesesteak phase where I just like can't stop eating Philly cheesesteaks. Like, I just love them so much. Well, I get that's Charlie's is probably the best place to get them in Iowa City at this point because I don't I don't really I don't know any other place that has cheese steaks, but so I would say Charlie's and then um I really like Monica's. I go there a lot. 
because we have a black card, so we'll go there and oh. eat there on Mon we eat Monica's. Um, I go to Noodles and Company a lot downtown, just because it's right there. It's quick. It's easy. It's good food. Um, let me think of other places. I I would say those are probably my main spots. Uh, Chick Fil A, obviously. My roommate really likes McDonald's. My roommate's Joe Toussaint. He eats McDonald's all the time. Uh, but yeah, I would say those are probably my my favorite spots: Panchero's, Charlie's, Monica's, Noodles. Yeah, Olive Garden. But yeah, I would say those are those are my good spots. Um, I want to ask you, you've been around a lot of Iowa, you've seen a lot of Iowa uniforms in the last 10 plus years you've been around the program. What is your favorite Iowa uniform that you've seen released? And what's oh. your favorite one you've worn? Oh, the one, uh, well, so I haven't worn this one, but I was going to say the gray ones that they wore against UConn in New York. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The ones with the Hawkeye logo on the front. And then like the, it says, it doesn't have your name. It says Hawkeyes, Hawkeyes. on the back. Yeah. Those ones are sweet. I, I'm mad I never got to wear those ones because I think those ones are so cool. But um, I like our black jerseys this year. I like our white jerseys too. But and then the ones that say like Iowa and cursive, the yellow ones, those are cool. Anytime we get an opportunity to wear alternate jerseys, that's obviously really cool. But my, my favorite jersey, I would say, is, the, is the, the gray one that says like Hawkeyes on the back with the logo right here. I would say that's cool. Yeah, that one's sweet. Um, I just have a couple questions left. I think Jack and I just have a few more left for you. Um, what going off the uniform thing? What was it like for you to finally put on a jersey your first game? Like, take us through that first game, like where you were gonna get a couple minutes. Like it was early on, but like, what did it mean to you after all this time waiting for that moment? Like this year, you're talking about, or like my or last year? Either or, whichever one you wanna. So I would dive say into. like my my first year. So I put a uniform on on my, my, my official visit my senior year, and I was kind of like, wow, like this is weird because I've only other seen other people wear these uniforms for however many years I've been here. Like I think it was like eight years at that point. And then I put it on, and I was like, whoa. And then we do like media day where I put on the jersey, and then I'm like, like this is crazy. Like I'm not, I'm not used to this. And then you go out there for the game. And like you go out, like you go out and you get subbed in for the first time, and it's nuts. Like, cause it's like I've been watching people play on this court for however long, and now like I'm out there, like I'm doing it. So it's like everything's moving a thousand miles an hour at first. Like we're playing. Like my first game out there was like Lindsey Wilson. Like they they were horrible, and like they were like at NAI school, and like I was like it, it still though was like everything was moving at like a million miles an hour. So like, but just like, like I was saying earlier, every possession that I was out there, the more it just slowed down and everything was easier. And then I feel like when I came out there this year against like the, the smaller schools, like earlier in the year, like everything also was kind of like, it was slower than the year before, just cause I had seen it all, I had seen it. And then now like, I'm kind of going through that same thing in big 10 play where like, it's just different. And the more I'm out there, just kind of the more comfortable I get with everything. That's cool. And so I want to ask you a question about your dad. Um, I, a lot of, you know, Hawks fans get very passionate when the Hawks win. They get very passionate when there's a Hawks loss, especially a close one. Mm -hmm. And when Hawks – so Hawks fans are always very high when there's a win, but, they you know, they come down hard even on social media. Oh, okay. when, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, like, when people start calling, like, you know, saying your dad should get fired after, you know, a close loss, you know, in Big Ten play after, you know – He's developed, you know, a bunch of guys, you know, you guys are performing like, you know, there's nothing wrong with the team, but mm -hmm. they praise you when you win, but they bash him when they lose. Like how, like when you guys are in the locker room and stuff, like what, like what goes through like your mind, like how crazy do you find it? Like when, you know, these Hawks fans say this type of stuff. Yeah. Well, I, well, I got off Twitter. After, I think it was after the Minnesota game on Christmas. I got off Twitter. Oh, that was Twitter, Twitter. Twitter was terrible that night. Toxic, bro. Like so toxic. And it's like, for what dude? Like we lost one game in the big 10. Like what? There's no reason for y'all to be acting like this. And like, it's just like, and like, cause the thing is like, I was, I, I was going to do Christmas with my family the next day, like with, with like my, my mom and my dad and my, my siblings and like, so I wasn't going to let, like, like we lost, yeah, and I'm competitive. Obviously, I don't want to lose, but, like, I'm not going to let it ruin, like, my whole Christmas, like, with my family. Like, that's a special time, especially right now in the middle of a pandemic. Like, I'm going to have fun with my family. And that's kind of the same – that's kind of the same mindset that the rest of our team has, I feel like, is, like, 
we try not to get too caught up into what people say on Twitter because at the end of the day, like, like what somebody tweets at me, like means absolutely nothing. Like in the grand scheme of things, like, unless it's, unless one of our coaches is on a burner or something and they like, like something like that, which I, which I highly doubt is going to happen. Like, it really means nothing like in the grand scheme of things. Cause only like I was saying earlier, the only opinions that matter are the ones in the locker room with us. Like the ones that are in the trenches with us every single day. Like those are the only opinions that we would ever listen to and that sort of thing. So it's like, I felt like at first, like when stuff like that was happening, especially when I was younger, cause I've been dealing with that stuff for a long time just cause of who my dad is, like people saying shit to me on Twitter or whatever. So like just kind of the more like, now, like, I've been dealing with probably since well, since I was literally in high school. Like, my freshman year of high school is when it probably first started. So now, like, I'm just kind of used to it. It's like, you just don't really pay it any mind. But, like, the, there's just just a lot of hypocrisy and, like, a lot of people. Like, you definitely know, like, who the real fans are. And there, there's a lot of experts out there <laughs> who sometimes even have a blue check next to their name who yeah. still are morons, who have no idea, like, what's going on. So it's just kind of like – we know what we have in the locker room. We know who we have. We know we know what we're capable of, and that's all that really matters to us. Like we just, you, you can't really buy too much into that stuff because, like I was saying, it's toxic. Like it's just gonna, it's gonna drain your mental. Like it's just gonna make you frustrated. And like we don't want like a couple bad fans or like a couple fair weather fans to take away because like we have a lot of really good support, like a lot of great support from Iowa fans. So it's like we wouldn't want those fans to kind of ruin the respect that we have for the other fans. So it's just like we know it's a very passionate fan base. There's not a lot going on in Iowa outside of like our team, the football team. So it's just kind of like we just take it with a grain of salt and we just keep moving forward. Because at the end of the day, we have another game in four days. So it's just kind of like we just kind of just keep plugging away. Yeah. And like one thing I want to ask you is, you know, obviously, you know, you're a college student. We're college students. We have a lot of teachers and the teachers you spend a lot of your time around are your coaches. So Mm -hmm. between Fran and the rest of the coaching staff, what makes them such great mentors and coaches with you guys? Like, how do how do they get through to all of you so well and keep the team chemistry, the environment so strong? I would say a lot of it has to do with like with how they treat us, like when it's not about basketball. Because like we know that their love and like appreciation for us goes so much deeper than just like what we're able to do like on the court. Like at the end of the day, like like. I've known Coach Taylor literally since the day I was born. I've known Courtney Eldridge since pretty much – he was playing for my dad, like, pretty much when I was born. Like, when I – like, Courtney Eldridge – Courtney Eldridge helped me when I was a baby. So, it's like, I know – and I've known Kirk Spiro and Sherman Dillard now for 10-plus years at this point. So, it's like, I know that, like, their that, like their care for me and everything like that is deeper than basketball. And a lot – not everybody can say the same things that I just said, except Connor, but – like everybody knows like that they care about them and it's so much deeper than just kind of the game. And like all of our coaches would go to war for any of us any day and we do the same for them. So it's just kind of that trust and that love and that loyalty, I think is what keeps us like locked into them and them locked into us. And so it's just kind of what keeps that relationship good. And what keeps our whole locker room going is that we all love and care for each other. Off the court, obviously we're on a podcast. Do you find yourself listening to any? And if you do, do you have any favorites? Yes, I listen to a lot of podcasts, honestly. Um, I like, have you guys ever listened to JJ Reddick's? Yep. I love that one. That's my favorite one. I listen to every episode. Like I listen to every single episode. And like Duncan Robinson just launched like a partner one to his. Yep. I listen to that one. I listen to the the All the Smoke one with Matt Barnes and Steven Jackson. I listen to that one. A decent amount. Like a lot of it depends. Well, I'll listen to JJ Reddick's every episode. It doesn't matter who the guest is, but a lot of them are like, like I remember I listened to like a road trip in one with Channing Frye and Richard Jefferson because they had LeBron on. Yeah. And like I listened to one with, um, there was a really interesting one I listened to with, uh, what's his name? Bill Simmons. Cause they had Jared Dudley on and it was right after they won the finals. So like I was listening to that one because Jared Dudley is somebody who I think is really cool, really interesting. So it was just kind of like a lot of it depends on the guest, but I listen to so many podcasts. It's, it's crazy. Have you listened to any non-sports podcasts? I'm just no. wondering. Yeah. Okay. No. So that's okay. me neither. <laughs> I was just no, wondering, I, I just wondered if you were like, you know, secretly like a closeted, like random type of, you know, but politics. Oh, he likes no, to get his morning fix. On the environment or. No, have you guys ever listened or not even listened? Have you guys watched uh, Entourage, the TV show? Of course. Yes. They have a podcast. I listen to that one. I saw that on Instagram. Really? Yeah. Is it yeah. is it any good? It depends on who they bring in. Like they yeah. brought in Ari. Yeah, like, they brought for, that was for, a good one. 
for two episodes. It was awesome. Like it was incredible. So I listened to that one. That's the sports related one I would listen to. But outside of that one, I really don't listen like any of them, not even sports. Like if they're not basketball related, I probably won't listen to them to be honest. But so, um yeah. So do you watch like ESPN and that stuff or like what type of content do you consume outside of podcasts? Like are um, you big on that stuff or do you mainly just scroll through or you're not really even on Twitter. So like, you know, how do you consume your media? Like, I would say, well, not like since now I deleted Twitter, but if, if I have Twitter, like it's, if it's not during the season, a lot of it's from Twitter. Like I'll read a lot of stuff on Twitter. Like that's where I get most of my information to be honest. So right now, I guess I'm kind of naked in that regard. I go on the ESPN app um, and I'll scroll through like college games and stuff. And I'll find out like who's playing that night. So I know which games to watch, what channels they're on, like that sort of stuff. So I'll watch it that way. But typically, like if it's not podcast, it's Twitter, but I'm not on Twitter right now. So then like, so then it goes to probably like Instagram or TikTok, stuff like that. But yeah, I would say like, and then a lot of it just like, I wouldn't say like, I watch like sports center or ESPN like that, like crazy, but it's more so like, I'll watch like the live sports, like things like that. Right. One podcast I'll say, or I'll just suggest you, you don't have to listen to any of them, but just look at one. Mike Tyson has produced a podcast. Okay. Yeah. That one sounds like it'd be so cool. And he's like, within the first five, he brought on Eminem and I was like, okay, I'm going to no, give yeah, it. A, that's one I, I listen to. I'm going to give it a try within three minutes. Not even, I'm not even going to say three minutes, maybe one and a half or two. I, I couldn't, I couldn't do it because no offense to Mike Tyson in any respect, but yeah. not a podcast type of voice. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> that would be an interesting one though. Cause I, I like Eminem. Like I like eight mile, like the movie, like, yeah. like I think Eminem's cool. So like I would listen to that one, but yeah, I can see how Mike Tyson would so much struggle <laughs> as a host. So my final question for you, and this is a very important question, probably the most important question we're going to ask on the podcast. All right, I'm ready. The bench environment just looks so fun. Like, okay, like when I went to Hawks games before COVID, like me and my buddies would try to get front row because like that's the only way to watch a game. Mm -hmm. And like I envied the bench because even though student section is fun, don't get me wrong, like the bench just looks so fun. Mm -hmm. If you need an extra man on the bench at all at the end of the season, just give me a chair, give me some warm-up basketball shorts, Hawks basketball shorts, and I'm good to go. All right, all right, I got you. I got you. That that's uh, that's a good talent to have. Is a good bench. Everybody needs a good bench guy. Everybody needs I'll, one. I'll hype it up. I'll, I'll work with the managers. Give some water. Work on the Gatorade. Get the perfect chair ready for you. Slide it in right. They'll when go half, and half on the water. Half and half on the water and Gatorade. The perfect level of hydration. Yeah, and towel you'll on the right shoulder. Win. I'll be ready to yes. go. Yeah, no, see, yeah, that's that's good to hear. Like, our scout team is, like, really good with, like, the energy on the bench. And, like, at the same time, like, they know all the other teams' plays. So if they recognize something or hear a call or something, then they're all screaming out, like, what what's coming up next. So that's also something that you could probably work on, too, to help oh. us out. Oh, for sure. Just give me the Zoom info. I'll hop on the Zoom meetings. I'll start, <laughs> I'll start studying, and I'll be ready to go. All right, sir. Dude, I got you. Dude, same thing. They're gonna make a movie about you, Sam, from Disney, and it's gonna be Rudy. Except it's gonna be, I, it's gonna be Sammy. <laughs> I, I'm ready, Patrick. Give me, give me the flight schedule. Let me know when the next road trip is, and just save me a seat, and I'll be ready to go. I got you, dude. I got you. No, but like, what's funny is like, you know, I'm, I'm definitely gonna shoot Patrick a text in like a week and say, <laughs> I have my bags. I'm ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, well, be on a Sunday. <laughs> I'm, I'm game. I'm game. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, like Sam entered and started the podcast with, if you haven't already, go ahead and download Good Pods, listen to this, follow us, see what we're listening to. Uh, as always, not the same time, same place. We will see you guys later.